Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. Graduating from the London School of Economics in the mid-80s, Victor Hagani set sail on a career in the fixed income markets. Joining Solomon Brothers and assuming a position in bond portfolio analysis, Victor became steeped in the math of bond markets and derivatives and part of a team that sought to conquer markets with science. He was among those who joined John Merriweather in the founding of LTCM in 1993 and as a partner experienced directly both the early spectacular success and the ultimate failure of the fund. Our conversation considers the lessons on market liquidity, on reflexivity and trade sizing, as well as the vulnerability of relative value trades to errant correlation assumptions. By 2002, Victor took up the case of the missing billionaires, wondering why there were so few now given that so many individuals had over a million dollars a century ago. He set out on a journey of inquiry focused on finding an asset allocation strategy that could preserve and grow wealth over time. Today, that work has come to life at Elm Partners, an asset management vehicle that Victor founded in 2011 and serves as CIO of. We discuss the premise of Elm, that passive indexation is generally effective but can be approved upon. In this context, Elm employs dynamic index investing, looking beyond market cap weighting to incorporate economic fundamentals like earnings yield and factors like value and momentum. With this approach, Victor and team hope to avoid busts that periodically occur while remaining exposed to the market such that wealth can compound over time. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my conversation with Victor Hagani. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Victor Hagani. He is the founder and CIO of Elm Wealth, a money management firm that deploys a strategy that they call dynamic indexing. Victor, it's great to have you on the podcast today. Thanks, Dean. Good to be here. Well, we were introduced recently through a mutual business contact to observe that I had used a quote of yours many times over the years that talks about the difference between financial market insurance and hurricane insurance. And that came out of some of your commentary around LTCM. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But for the purposes of our conversation, it'd be great to just get a little bit acquainted with you and your background in markets. You've obviously been in the markets for many, many years. Take us back to the beginning. How did you get started? What initially spurred your interest in finance? I studied finance at the London School of Economics, graduated in 1984. And I guess it was just pretty normal for a lot of us to be looking for jobs in the world of finance. And I got my job offer from Solomon Brothers to join a group of theirs in New York that was doing bond analytics. It was called the Bond Portfolio Analysis Group, BPA. And I worked in a group that was called the Hedge Group, where we did a lot of modeling and analysis of futures and hedging things. And as swaps and caps and floors and swap options were going, We spent a lot of time looking at that. And after a couple of years, I was invited to join the bond arbitrage desk run by John Merriweather out on the trading floor. And then John stayed my boss for the rest of my career, following from Solomon Brothers to then on to LTCM and beyond. And it was only when I started my business, Elm Partners, in 2011 that sort of off on my own doing a business without John. So yeah, I guess that's kind of my background in a nutshell. Started in financial markets at Solomon Brothers in 1984 on the fixed income side and then increasingly got focused on wealth management issues. The first 20 years of my career, I never really thought much about what to do with my savings. I would get compensated. Some of the compensation went into Solomon stock to begin with. A lot of it went into LTCM investments later on. And it was only after all of that that I really started to focus on how I should invest my family's savings. And that led to the formation of Elm, where we try to help people with thinking about the long term, getting the most in the long term from their wealth, both in terms of investing and thinking about how to spend it and linking those two things together. Well, there'll be so much for us to talk about there. I'm really interested in exploring the framework that you've developed over the years that you've been running Elm which I think is about nine years. Uh, Before that, you had the benefit of a nine-year sabbatical to think things over. I'm going to get some advice from you, maybe off the call, just so I can pursue something similar. (laughs) It's just some good time to think. 
And I think just around this notion of trying to manage wealth, there's a lot of landmines out there. People would argue that stock prices are, by most metrics, very, very high. Bond prices, i.e. low interest rates, are high bond prices below the stated rate of inflation. So it's not obvious what to do. I'm eager to learn more about the process that you use on behalf of your clients to stay invested in the market, but to try to avoid some of those nasty drawdowns. Let's talk a little bit about LTCM if we can. I was a newbie in markets. I was out of business school from the University of Chicago in 1996. My first big assignment was covering LTCM from the equity derivatives side. So it wasn't really looking at anything on the rate side. What was your focus as a partner at LTCM? What was your area of expertise? I had been working in the New York ARB group, but being the youngest member of the team, I was sent around the world by John Merriweather to interact with the growing arbitrage activities that we had going on in Japan and also in London. Although, and, you know, I guess it was just trying to help us all think about things in similar ways and to exchange ideas and technology around what we were doing. So it was pretty natural for me once LTCM was founded to move to London and get our London office going. And so I was the head for a while of the London office on my own and then joined by a partner, Hans Hofschmidt, and we ran it together. And mostly we were doing all kinds of fixed income relative value trades within the European world. So gilts and bunds and OATs and all that. There's a certain classification of the trades that you and others were active in that you might call convergence trades, that at a date certain in the future, asset A and asset B, one of which you're long, the other you're short, will converge in price. There are other trades, and I would put the equity vol trades in this category, that are a little bit more forecast trades. You see an option price that carries an implied volatility that perhaps well outstrips the realized volatility, and you say, you know, I can dynamically hedge this over time, and from a Backtesting or mean reversion basis, I think I'm going to profit from this, but there's certainly nothing that will force the convergence of those two. I'd just be curious to get your take on that and maybe to give us a little bit more of a flavor for the categories of trades that you saw and were engaged in at LTCM. That's a good question. I would say that most of the risk that we had on the books would be closer to a definition of convergence trades, although. In many of the cases, those horizons were super long-term. I mean, one trade that people talk about was Shell versus Royal Dutch Shell, basically two share classes of the same company with the same rights. And actually, the one trading at a discount arguably looked a little bit better on a fundamental basis in terms of taxation. And things would trade 10% apart from each other, and they paid the same dividends, et cetera. And So to a very long-term horizon, you could say they were convergent in the sense that all the cash flows representing those share ownerships would be the same, but you were getting one set of cash flows for 10% less. But that was a really, really long-term horizon. And then all kinds of things could happen in between, like the discount can widen out to 20%, and then Shell says, oh, we're just going to retire all of these shares at a 15% discount, and now you're locked in with a 5% loss if you got in at 10%. You know, I mean, there's different things that could happen that sort of would force you to lose money on the trade permanently. So nothing was a pure convergence trade. And then towards the other end of the spectrum, we would do yield curve trades, which were not convergence trades. You know, it was a view on what central bank policy would be. We had some yield curve trades on the books. We had trades around different convergences within Europe that were not set in stone that things would happen that way. They were bets on the way that political winds would go and which countries would join the euro, et cetera. So it was a real spectrum. And I think the vol trades don't really have that convergence feature at all, except to the extent that you might be trading one region against a different region. You might be selling some European vol, buying US vol. And if the spread is big enough, you might say, geez, this seems a little bit strange that volatility in those markets would diverge by this much over time. But mostly, When it came to long-term equity vol, we were selling at levels that we thought was not justified by sort of the economic variability or the variability in earnings and dividends going out into the future and making also adjustments for changes in discount rates as well. So kind of there was sort of an underlying idea that goes back to the Schiller work on excess equity volatility that was 
kind of an underlying idea there when we looked at vol. And then, of course, the biggest thing was trying to understand what was causing vol to trade at these elevated levels and getting an understanding for the structured product market where there was just a lot of long-dated demand from issuers of structured products to retail investors that was keeping vol high. So we sort of had this explanation that, oh, there's these guys that really need to buy a five-year vol and that's why it's trading at 28% volatility, whereas short-term vol is trading at 17% volatility because it's a more balanced market. So anyway, I think there was kind of that spectrum. Things that we didn't do was like just go long the 30-year bond because we thought the 30-year bond was going to go up. So we didn't take these real directional bets on the market for the most part. We tried to keep things at least theoretically neutral to the stock and bond markets overall in currency markets. Well, if we could just maybe run with the equity derivative side, because I think this maybe above all was a market that just broke. At least parts of it have broken since then as well. There's a kind of well-known period in 2010, which is right after the flash crash. There was this sense in the, again, post-crisis period that even a AAA counterparty had to post collateral. And Warren Buffett had sold just an enormous block of long-dated puts on the euro stocks, the S&P, and so forth. So really not trading the vol, but certainly short a lot of vol, <laughs> just basically betting the index would be higher after 10 years. And so he was going to just basically buy all this stuff back because he didn't want to post the collateral. And that just sent the whole market into a tizzy. And ultimately, you had 10-year variant swaps print just about 40 as a level which is just an astronomically high number. So you do have these kind of dislocations in especially the long-dated part of the market. And I think that's really what happened in August, September, October of 1998 as well. You had this comment in the aftermath of the portfolio unwind, which really referred to this differentiation between financial market insurance, so things like selling volatility or taking illiquidity risk, and distinguishing that verse from something like hurricane risk, something that happens in the world of Mother Nature. Can you walk through that? I'd love to just learn, given I've used the quote so many times, I'd love to learn more about how you think about that, kind of what made you essentially create that analogy. <laughs> I don't think I created that analogy. I think the idea of feedback loops and the endogeneity of the price process, something that a lot of economists and observers and market participants have talked about over time. But for us, it was interesting because we actually owned some of these hurricane bonds, in fact. And of course, with everything else that was known that we owned, and this was a really small holding, the markdown was just incredible. And it was like, okay, they're going to have to liquidate those bonds at some point. So there was no change in the forecast of hurricanes. But the bonds themselves got marked down, I don't know, 20 points or something, <laughs> because it was felt that there was going to be a fire sale of the relatively small amount of bonds that we held, which was just sort of indicative of that sort of feedback loop. So I think that the prices of all financial assets have this sort of feedback loops that you get with people extrapolating out into the future, recent performance, people hitting stop losses. So the market goes down and that causes it to go down further. So I guess in some ways, what's interesting is not that the, I mean, it's interesting that the feedback loops exist and more specifically, even the feedback loops exist in a way that tends to create momentum in different things. And related more specifically to the LTCM experience, I think that one of the observations that have come following that is that sort of the more closely related two things are then I think that the more fat-tailed is the risk that you get out of them. If you're just going long stocks, that there's certain volatility to the stock, volatility moves around, sometimes stocks are more or less risky than at other times. And if you kind of think about how fat-tailed that distribution is relative to a normal distribution, sure, it's pretty fat-tailed. It's not looking like a normal distribution. But now if you take two things that are kind of really meant to be the same, like a 30-year bond and a 29-year bond is one of the sort of iconic example. You take these two things and they're really supposed to be the same. And so in general, they trade really close to each other. And then at some point, there's like some excess demand for the on-the-run bond, and it widens out to now being 15 basis points richer than that off-the-run bond that's 29 years to maturity. 
okay, so there was sort of that risk. But since they're supposed to be the same thing, they really should not have any volatility in the spread at all. So whatever volatility is there, it's kind of hard to justify with any sort of underlying economics, such as when we're talking about the stock market, well, there's the future stream of earnings and that people's estimates of that is changing all the time based on expectations of productivity, growth, innovation, et cetera. And so there's some underlying economic uncertainty there that's driving some of the volatility at least. But with this 29 to 30 year bond trade, it's almost like all the volatility is coming from supply and demand. And if these two things can be 15 basis points apart from each other, why can't they be 30 basis points apart from each other? And why can't they be 50 basis points apart from each other, which we saw in bonds that were maturing. There was this nine and a quarter versus nine and seven eighths bonds maturing in 2016, I think, which was a trade that people had on just before I joined the ARB desk in New York in 1986. That spread got to be like 50, 60 basis points apart. And then you got the feedback loop in there where all of a sudden it's like, okay, now they're 50 basis points apart. And the repo market then as a reaction to that, the repo market is, oh my goodness, people are going to borrow this. I think it was the nine and a quarter was the rich one. You know, people are going to want to borrow the nine and a quarter to short it. So it gets really expensive in the repo market. And then people are saying, oh, well, now it doesn't look quite as rich as a trade anymore because you have to pay all this money on the borrow, on the bond. And I just think that the bottom line here is that when you think about stock prices, they have fat tails, but you just don't get events which are six times the normal standard deviation, let's say. But I don't like to call them six sigma events because that's kind of implying that there's some normal distribution. But I'm just saying like you have the normal volatility and you don't get these sort of six times moves relative to that or 10 times moves relative to that. But in relative value trades, you get that periodically. And so I think if you went back to 1985 or something and thought about on the run, off the run bond spreads, and then you saw this nine and seven eighths versus nine and a quarter 30 year treasury trade blow out to like 50 or 60 basis points. You would say, oh my goodness, that was just a move that was 10 times bigger than what anybody has seen before. And it's just because there isn't like some economic fundamentals under it. It's this sort of supply and demand thing, which requires capital and capital just doesn't move fast enough in some cases. And I think that's a way to perspective anyway, to sort of understand the difficulty in doing relative value trades and judging just how bad they can go against you. If you look at something like that on the run, off the run pairs trade, and you realize, of course, the US treasury market isn't giving away a lot of free money. There may be small liquidity premium attached to certain issues. And so if you put this trade on, you've really got to size it up for it to be meaningful. And that sizing, you're going to get convinced of based on The net risk of the position, which is really derived from this notion of correlation between the two, and you're the expert on this, but what I've learned is if I take my 98% correlation and I move it to 93, that's actually really meaningful for the net risk of the position, that when you start at such a high level of overlap between the behavior of these two things, taking it down even a little bit actually increases the risk profile of the pairs position quite a bit. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I found that interesting. And we'll move on from LTCM. But the other thing I wanted to ask you was this. LTCM is one of the four case studies that comprises the class I teach at St. John's University, which is my alma mater. It's a class on episodes of financial crisis, and we sprinkle in derivatives since, as Harley Bassman says, typically in a crisis, convexity is lurking at the scene of the crime. (laughs) It's oftentimes leverage and derivatives that is a part of a big risk off. But one of the pieces of research in the aftermath of LTCM that I read essentially pointed to the portfolio as being really, really well explained by changes in credit spreads. I mean, upwards of 60 or 70% correlation of the mark-to-market value of the portfolio. Which is, to me, credit spreads are a form of the stock market. They're like the VIX. It's a risk segment. Credit spreads are going to widen a lot in a risk off. Number one, is that your sense? We didn't have the term risk on, risk off back in 1998. But when you look at the portfolio now or, again, after it's faltering, did you see that the firm was much less diversified? Or do you feel that it was 
properly diversified in this kind of notion of risk on, risk off? We knew and we felt that the portfolio was risk on in the sense that a major financial crisis would be bad for the portfolio. We thought that we could withstand that. We stress tested the portfolio. We certainly weren't approaching the portfolio construction using historical volatilities and VAR analysis and that sort of thing. We were thinking of it through the lens of sustainability through crises. But no, I mean, I think ultimately the failure of LTCM was really the focus on LTCM specifically once the fund was down 20% or so and we went out to try to start raising money. I mean, it was a situation where if we had been smaller, if we hadn't been the focus of the market, that we would have probably weathered the whole thing. But instead, we were large. People were paying attention to what we were doing. There were a lot of similar positions held by different Wall Street banks and other hedge funds. And when we lost money, we thought, well, the right thing to do here, rather than really try to bring all the positions dramatically down, was to try to raise capital. And we were talking to a number of capital providers and Goldman was helping us in the process as well as JP Morgan. And it was like every day they'd go out and they'd say, okay, we raised another 200 million. We're up to 800 million now. And then we just couldn't raise the money and we didn't bring the money in. We were just trying to circle it up and then bring it in all at once. And we just couldn't keep up with it. And I think that as we were finding people that were like, yeah, we'd like to invest in this. It was just that the information about our distress was getting more and more out there, causing things to move against us further. I guess it was not the right decision to try to raise capital in that environment. I think if we went back, we would have said, okay, we just need to cut these positions really quickly and really dramatically, rather than say, well, we'll keep these positions. The best thing for our outside investors is the positions and just bring in a lot more money. I mean, people wanted to give us so much money when we were closed. <laughs> you know, we thought, well, now that we're open, we'll bring in $2 billion. That will cover our $800 million of losses and give us another $1.2 billion or whatever of capital against everything. And we'll cut some positions and there we go. But that didn't work out. Let's move on to the here and now and your efforts at Elm Wealth. I'm really interested to learn more. In taking a spin through your website, I came across, and I really would love for you to walk through the case of the missing billionaires. I think it's, a, number one, a great video, but it seems to have sponsored some of your thinking about how to maintain and grow wealth over time. But in a nutshell, can you describe how you came about this, to think about this conundrum and exactly what it is? As you mentioned earlier, I was taking a break from the financial markets and putting more focus on to figuring out what to do with what was left of my family's savings post-LTCM. And as I was thinking about it, I realized that there were all of these headwinds that we as investors face in terms of long-term investing. And I guess I was reading more and more about behavioral economics and the various biases and mistakes that we as humans tend to make when making financial decisions, trying to make rational choice decisions. And I thought a really amazing sort of illustration of this was to realize that back in 1900, 120 years ago, the U.S. Census pointed out that there were like 4,000 families that had a million dollars or more of wealth back at that time. And thinking about those 4,000 families then with over a million dollars, and some of them had over $100 million. And then realizing like how powerful it would have been if they had been invested in the stock market from then to the present. And okay, for each one of those families, they would have a lot of descendants. Let's assume that their families grew in, in numbers according to sort of average number of children per couple, et cetera. That there should have been like 120,000 billionaire families today that could trace their wealth back to these families of 1900. And when you looked at like the Forbes rich list for America or whatever, instead of there being 120,000, instead of like all the top most wealthy families in America being families that had more than a million dollars back in 1900, it's like there's none. There's basically not one billionaire family that comes from some seed capital back then. And of course, there's all kinds of things that you could explain some of that with. I mean, there are taxes, there's philanthropy, there's 
some high consumption by some people. But given just how many of those families had like $50 million, and when you just put the whole thing together, you kind of realize that there's some amazingly strong headwinds against growth of wealth or people earning the returns that they should. And I gave a lot more thought to that. And I guess where I came out was, well, what can we control as investors? We can control our costs. We can control how diversified we are. We can control some degree of tax efficiency. We can control how we spend our money. So we could do all those things. I think those are the lowest hanging fruits. But then we have to also sort of protect ourselves against making bad investment decisions. And I think that passive investing goes a long way towards doing that. I think we've had a real improvement in the last 20 years in the health of many people's portfolios, comparing how people are managing their wealth today with how they were doing it in the 1960s when the typical brokerage account of an American held two stocks in it. <laughs> that was the degree of diversification in 1960 from a Fed study. Today, the typical portfolio has some index funds in it. Maybe not so internationally diversified as they should be, but there's going to be some index funds in there these days, or ETFs in many cases, and sort of default options in a lot of 401k programs, etc. So I just got to thinking, well, okay, the passive is good, but I realized that looking at myself and thinking about most other people, that the passive is only like half the answer, that you also that you're just not going to be able to go for a long period of time without changing your asset allocation. Right now, people are thinking, oh, is this the beginning of a big bear market? We talked about that just before this call. The market's feeling a little bit edgy. Maybe I should reduce some risk here. Maybe if the market goes down another 5%, more people would reduce their exposure to equities. This is the beginning of the deluge, whatever. And the way that we would make that decision is by sort of trying to read the tea leaves, by what we're reading in the press, by what we're seeing on TV. And I felt that I would do that too. And that in general, I felt that I probably wouldn't do a good job at that. But I did want to feel that my portfolio was responding to changing market conditions. And that really led me to say, well, if I could come up with a couple of rules that move my portfolio in a way that I would generally like it to move on an ex-ante basis, but that these rules were rules that I could stick to and sort of take all of the emotion and subjectivity and behavioral biases and foibles out of things, that would be really attractive for me. And as I started to talk to other people about it, I found that there was a lot of interest in it for many investors. And the way that we do things at Elm is that we try to think about what's the long-term expected return, say, of equities or different equity markets like Europe and the U.S., and we try to move the portfolio exposure to those asset classes up and down based on whether that expected return is higher or lower relative to safe assets over time. So we're looking at the earnings yield as one important pillar of the long-term expected return. And then we're also combining that with a trend or momentum metric. So using the two things combined sort of gives us the behavior of asset allocation over time that is what a lot of people conceptually would like to be doing themselves. So when the market goes down, you kind of want to buy from a long-term earnings yield point of view. But to begin with, momentum has gone negative, so you want less. And so those kind of balance each other out. And then at some point, the market's lower and momentum goes positive, And now you're going to be overweight, et cetera. So that's kind of how we manage things. Once we thought that that was a good way to do things, we did a back test. It wasn't let's do the back test first and then do the strategy afterwards. It was here's something that really makes sense. Now, I guess you could say from a Bayesian point of view, our prior was this is a good way to invest. Okay, let's look at the data and see if the data changes our mind about that from a Bayesian point of view. So if we went back historically and found that, oh, this actually is really a bad way to invest, then we would update our priors and say, okay, we're not going to invest like this. But it really started off with a positive prior belief that this was a good way to invest. And indeed, the historical data probably make that belief even stronger than it w would have been going back in time. You've got a couple of things there that I want to ask more questions on. And just in terms of, as you think about, let's say, within equities, allocating across, whether it's industries geographical segments, maybe factors, that based on some perspective view of return, 
and then across the risk asset landscape and then the safe asset landscape, that dynamic process as well. Before we dive into that, I just wanted to get your take on the basic strategy of indexation. Let's just say the spider. You've done some writing, I think pushing back a little bit against the notion that the things like market cap weighted strategies are just prone to being overly momentum based because you just keep buying the bigger and bigger stocks that you're buying the winners. So you've pushed back against that a little bit. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. And then the second just related is how do you get away from it's 2000 and you're a index manager to technology stocks and you're buying the triple Q at a 70 PE. At what point do you say, boy, I'm supposed to be price agnostic. I'm just in the market, but the price of entry is just so unappetizing. I've got to do something. So it's sort of a two-part question. The first being the your pushback on the notion of indexation being just a closet momentum strategy. So let's start with the second one first. So that question is exactly why we do this dynamic index investing approach, because we think it's really important for investors to have their eyes open and not just to say, whether it's tech stocks or Japan, Japan in 1988 or whatever, well, it happens to be 40% of global market cap. The PE is 100, whatever. I'm just going to have to keep 40% of my money in that because that's what its market cap is as part of the global MSCI or indeed in the US in 2000, the tech sector, but even the overall stock market in 2000 that measured relative to a safe asset was offering a very, very low or even negative excess long-term return. I think it's really important to have your eyes open looking at expected returns. So when you talk about a really high PE on NASDAQ, from our perspective, that means you should have a lot less risk exposure to that because the expected return is so low relative to the safe asset. That's at the core of doing your asset allocation based on expected returns rather than based on some historically set strategic asset allocation that you're just going to stick to no matter what. So I think that when it comes to these broad markets that you need to be focused on expected returns to make your asset allocation decisions. And so a dynamic asset allocation, in my mind, isn't a good idea only if markets are inefficient. It's a good idea as long as the expected return on assets changes over time, which everybody believes that they do. The only reason to have a, street, to have a fixed asset allocation is if you believe that the expected return or the expected attractiveness on different asset classes is just fixed relative to each other all the time, which again, I don't think anybody believes that. So it's not based on a market inefficiency existing. When it comes to indexing itself, indexing should be compared to stock picking or active management stock picking, you know, rather than this question about the overall expected return of the market. And to begin with, I think there are really valid criticisms of the S&P 500 index. It's a poor index. It's not a complete index. It suffers from large inclusions and exclusions, which can hamper returns. The S&P 500 index committee is sort of making subjective decisions about what companies should be in the index and what companies shouldn't be in the index. So when I think about indexing, I like to think about broad indexes like the CRISP index or the FTSE indexes or just the MSCI broader indexes, which are covering 97% of stocks, don't have a lot of turnover, don't have a lot of slippage from inclusions and exclusions. So let's, we're going to focus on that and acknowledge that the S&P 500 or the Russell 1000 or whatever, that these indexes do have some problems to do with their construction. So there's a couple of things that people have criticized index funds for. I think one of them is a lot of people have referred to it as like a big momentum machine or the mother of all momentum machines. And to my mind, an index fund is neutral with regard to momentum. It's not a positive that if you own an index fund, that you're not buying the stocks that have gone up the most. So you own an index fund. And so when a stock goes up, you're not going out and buying more of it. You just own more of it because it's gone up, but you're not buying more of it. The momentum strategy is one where when something goes up, you go out and buy it. And when something goes down, you sell it. So the index fund, as an index fund investor, you're not doing that. And if you bring money into an index fund, well, then it just depends on where the money is coming from. So if you are taking money away from a manager who's been losing money, then what you're doing is you're selling the stocks 
that that mutual fund manager owns, you're selling the ones that have gone down, and now you're buying the whole market. So you could say that that trade from taking money away from an active manager who's been losing money, kind of by definition, is a positive momentum trade that you've just done. But it's not clear where the money is coming from that goes into the index funds. And if that is the case, it's kind of strange to blame the index fund to say that the index fund is a momentum machine. It's really people taking money out of losing managers that have recently lost money is a momentum, is kind of what underlies momentum behavior. The other criticism that you get with index funds, which is kind of a Rob Arnott fundamental indexing argument, is that index funds own have higher weights of overvalued companies. Well, If you don't really have a view about the whole idea of owning an index fund is you don't know which companies are overvalued and undervalued, you might accept that that every company is either overvalued or undervalued versus some true value. But the fundamental indexing argument is saying that large companies tend to be overvalued and small companies tend to be undervalued. Well, if you believe that, you should do that trade. But the whole premise of indexing is that you don't have any idea what's going on out there. I mean, if you had that view, and if you're right, it's kind of a money machine that, okay, I'm just going to be long small companies because they're undervalued. I'm going to go short large companies because they're overvalued. But I think that the argument of fundamental indexing is kind of fundamentally flawed from a logical point of view, as long as you start off with the idea that we don't know. Why do we think that the large companies are the ones that are overvalued? If you don't really have a view about overvaluation and undervaluation, it's not like index funds have a flaw that's baked into them, which is really the argument that you get from the fundamental indexing crowd. There's a number of things there that I wanted to respond to. And I certainly understand your thought process on where does the money come from? That would seem to matter. There was a period in 2017, I think both BlackRock, its passive index group and Vanguard were taking in something on the order of a billion dollars of fresh money per day. You know, they're going to turn around and buy Apple, Amazon, and Google and Microsoft and so forth. But it's interesting to think about where that money might have come from. The other thing that I just think is very powerful in our industry, I'd love to get your take on this, is just this notion of benchmarking. There are hedge funds that are absolute return. That's their mandate. But even that, if you go and look at a time series of correlations of some hedge fund index to the S&P, you see that correlation's gone up over time. So the ability to print truly negatively correlated returns is very difficult. And the power of the S&P as a benchmark and the fear in the active manager from underperforming that benchmark leaves very little wiggle room. So they might say, well, I'm underweight Microsoft by 30 basis points, and that's heroic. (laughs) And so the index, the benchmark index is such a gravitational force for managers that that itself becomes part of, I think, the pull of capital towards these mega cap companies. Tell me a little bit more about your dynamic index process and specifically the momentum aspect. I think we talked about this a little bit on a different call where I was relating, and again, I just want to hear how you think about it, but I was relating perhaps your momentum strategy to something like vol scaling. We're decelerating our exposure based on movements, let's say higher in realized volatility. That is kind of the mathematical signal to start to scale down my sizing so I can potentially avoid disaster. I'd love to just hear a little bit more about how the momentum strategy works, what it's done in different, let's say, sharp drawdown periods for the clients of Elm Wealth. Momentum is something that a few had sort of talked about it within academic financial circles during this sort of heyday of efficient markets thinking from, say, the 1970s up to the 1990s. People would have just sort of scoffed at that, like, can't exist. It's too simple. Markets have to be efficient enough to not have momentum actually be something that people can make money on because all that you're doing is just looking at some really simple price metrics and then deciding whether to be long or short something based upon that. But I think that over time, there has become this general consensus that in some domains where the capital or where the size of these markets is so large that the behavior of investors in terms of chasing returns, extrapolating recent performance into the future, et cetera, really does create 
substantial momentum effects in all kinds of different asset prices. And even Gene Fama, the father of the efficient markets view of public markets, referred to momentum as the mother of all anomalies. And I think that's a reasonable way to think about it, that it's we can come up with some stretched arguments about why it's a compensation for some sort of risk premium. But I think that most people kind of feel, well, it's really coming from the nature of how people make decisions and the behavior of markets. And return chasing, where as some asset is going up, that people are increasing their exposure to it over time and over a longer term horizon, makes it possible for people following momentum strategies, which are much more binary, to sort of catch those return chasing driven rallies or sell offs in assets and create a better risk adjusted return on their investment. So we felt that rather than only looking at the long term expected return, say, of equities based on the earnings yield or the cyclically adjusted earnings yield of different equity markets, we felt that it would be good to combine this long term sort of valuation driven expected return or long-term cash flow driven expected return with something that was also kind of capturing some market dynamics, some market sentiment. And so we decided to combine it with a momentum metric, a time series momentum metric based on the overall performance of the market, not looking at individual stocks relative to each other. And historically, it's added a lot of value to an approach that's only looking at a long-term sort of cash flow based expected return. And with regard to its application to equity investing, as we talked about before, it is the case that generally when volatility of the equity market goes up, it's also a time when equity market momentum is negative. And so there's a pretty strong correlation between a strategy which is using a momentum overlay to increase or decrease equity exposure over time with a strategy that's doing vol targeting where that strategy is reducing exposure to equities when realized volatility or implied volatility has gone up and vice versa, taking more risk when volatility is lower. And we kind of prefer the momentum approach to doing this just because it's simpler. And with vol targeting, it's kind of, you don't really know, you have to answer more parameterization questions in terms of how do you want to turn that into a strategy? Because what should you use for a centering point of volatility? What do you do when volatility is down at 12% for equity markets? Are you going to go leverage yourself two times at that point? I mean, it just depends on, as I said, I think there's just a lot more complexity in vol targeting than there is in using a momentum overlay. And they're both kind of going in the same sort of direction. So for simplicity purposes, which we think is really important, we use momentum for that. Well, you mentioned Gene Fama and calling momentum the mother of all, what would you call it, inconsistencies? I don't know if that's a nod towards- Well, he said anomalies. Anomalies. He used the word anomalies yeah. in his quote. That's right. I don't know yeah. if that's a nod towards Richard Thaler on the behavioral side, but I'm seeing another one of your papers here on value and momentum. And Gene Fama's, his disciple is Cliff Asnes and really has done a tremendous amount in terms of this notion of value and momentum. I think one of his- early papers was called The Interaction Between Value and Momentum Strategies. Tell us a little bit about your case study for using value and momentum. What did you learn and how can they be effectively used? So yeah, Cliff wrote a really seminal paper, I think with a few colleagues called Value and Momentum Everywhere. We find talking about value and momentum as, as we apply it a little bit confusing for people because when people think of value, sometimes they're just thinking of these strategies that buy individual equities at a low price to book. Whereas when we're talking about value with regard to asset allocation, we're talking about the long-term expected return of the overall stock market relative to the return on the safe asset. But basically, this idea that following one strategy, which is kind of a contrarian strategy, buying more of something when it goes down, when it's offering a higher expected return, is very intuitive to people, very attractive. People like the idea of doing that. But it turns out that in many markets, Momentum is even a stronger signal of medium-term performance. And the beauty that Cliff pointed out in his work was also that these two approaches, it could be an approach to stock picking was a lot of the where Cliff was talking about it, but it can also be an approach to asset allocation, that these two approaches or these two metrics for making your scaling decisions 
tend to be negatively correlated that when value or when your valuation type metrics are working well, it can be a time when momentum isn't doing as well. And when momentum is doing well, it tends to be a time when valuation based approaches aren't doing as well. And so that negative correlation between these two things, which both are kind of justified from a fundamental point of view or a theoretical point of view and an empirical point of view is really attractive. And Cliff, I think, really got a lot of people thinking about that. And we found that there had been no study that looked at asset allocation in an implementable form. And so we did that analysis. That was really the analysis that I was talking about earlier, where we had this idea that this is how we wanted to invest our own savings. But let's go back and take a look at this back to 1900 in a fashion that you could imagine somebody could have implemented back then. So we did this back test, which involved a lot of collecting of historical data. And eventually that study got published in the Journal of Portfolio Management. Cliff was actually, I think, the referee of it ultimately for the journal. And I talked to Cliff about it back at the time. As I say, at that time, there hadn't been a study. There hadn't been a study of an implementable strategy for managing wealth using value and momentum applied to asset allocation, not to sort of a cross-sectional analysis looking at long and short stocks or long and short different commodities and so on. And since then, there's been a lot of other studies that have gone that way. As I say, we set it up in a way that would have been sort of reasonably implementable for investors all the way back then to the present. There were some other studies that were a little bit more, I would almost say academic, that was sort of doing calculations of doing it in a way that wouldn't really have been implementable, but showed the same result even more powerfully because it was kind of a more extreme version of its application. Well, we live in this unfortunate world of political polarization, and in some ways there's asset price polarization as well. Some of these discrepancies in terms of valuation have really attracted a lot of attention. Cliff Asnes has been in the debate as being pushed so far on the value is cheap notion that he even was convinced to actually overweight value, which would not be an AQR premise to start with. It would be to stay with the plan. Robert Knott has also had a lot to say on this. When you kind of step back and your firm uses a lot of data, you're looking at relationships and using back tests, how do you overlay judgment around, well, maybe this time is different, that idea that Perhaps the past is a useful guide, but maybe things have changed. Maybe its technology has changed so much. We talked a little bit about the original tech bubble and the vast valuation discrepancies between the hot tech stocks and then the old economy stocks and how cheap value had gotten at that time. It got real cheap again. How do you kind of balance the use of data and being convicted by data and back tests with some caution that times may have changed and the present is never exactly like the past? So first of all, what we do at Elm, we don't do any of this kind of value that we're talking about with regard to AQR and Cliff. In other words, we're not building portfolios that are tilted towards value stocks. We're using the long-term earnings yield of the stock market to decide how much of U.S. equities we want to own? How much of European or Japanese equities do we want to own? And so within the portfolio that we own growth stocks and value stocks. So that's where this confusion of the word value comes in because people, when they think about value, they think about this whole debate around value versus growth and building of different stock portfolios. Whereas we're using these broad indexes and just trying to decide how much equity exposure do you want to have at any point in time? But your question is totally valid about we came up with what we thought was a sensible way to invest money, to invest wealth. And then we had a prior belief. We thought this is a good idea, but maybe the way to think about it is we think that looking back in 1900, if we had thought about this approach back then, this is what we thought would be the expected return or the expected excess return on a static strategy and how confident we would be in that back then. And then we sort of run data coming forward and we do a Bayesian sort of updating of that and you get to the end and it's like, well, you're going to now have a certain degree of belief based on where you started and what you experienced. And so in general, I think that all investing is you have some prior beliefs and you're just updating that as new information comes in. We're constantly thinking about what we're doing and 
whether things have changed in a really material way. And there would be times when we could imagine making relatively substantial changes to what we're doing. I mean, I guess one example I could give you would be, so the way that we decide how much equity is overall to own is we look at the earnings yield of, say, all the, the global equity market. Right now, it's around, I don't know, close to 6%, I think, is the earnings yield, the cyclically adjusted earnings yield of the global equity market. Let's call it 6%. That might be a little bit high. And what we do is we compare it to the 10-year tip yield, which is right now about minus 0.9%. So we say, gosh, the excess expected return of equities to a very long horizon on a global basis is like 6.9%. Based on that, I want to own a lot more equities than I want to own of tips, let's say. But I'm using the 10-year tips. Maybe I should be using the 30-year tips yield. What if the 10-year tips yield, what if inflation really got sustained and higher and short-term interest rates didn't go up and people thought that the Fed was going to keep real rates at minus three or 4% for a long time. And so all of a sudden, let's just imagine, it's not unimaginable because right now there are some two-year tips that are trading at minus 4%. So let's imagine that people kind of start to believe in this long-term massively negative real rate thing and 10-year tips start to trade at minus 4%, okay? And then we look at the global equity market and we notice, wow, it's gone up a lot. The earnings yield of global equities is 1%. So we say, oh, well, equities really are still offering some nice value. They're offering an extra 5% relative to this minus 4% tips yield. Well, we would realize that this isn't working, that this doesn't make sense anymore. And we would say, well, what we really need to think about is a perpetual tips rate, which we can't see because it doesn't exist. The 30 year is closer to a perpetual. I'm sure that if 10 year tips were at minus 4%, 30 year tips would be a lot closer to zero than 4%. But a perpetual tip would have to be positive. Perpetual tip couldn't trade at a negative yield because it would have an infinite price. So we would say, okay, we've got to change what we're doing a little bit here. We're not going to use the 10 year tip as the benchmark anymore for assessing the safe asset. We have to use something much longer than that even if we can't observe it. And now we're saying, well, equities are offering a 1% real return in the long term. The perpetual tip is offering, say, 0.1% or something or 0.5%. Oh, equities really aren't offering us the value that we want. Oh, but we can't buy perpetual tips. Okay, so we have to think through all of that. And that would be a bit of a change in our framework. Like, that's one thing. I mean, there could be many, many others. So I think that when you're following something that's rules-based, you're trying to figure out what's a big enough change in reality to make a change to what you're doing. But in general, your investors and everybody wants you to stick to those rules as much as possible. So in the spectrum of things, we really stick to our rules and we don't change the rules much, but sometimes we have to change the rules as well. Well, you're a student of markets and have an academic approach to many of the problems and puzzles that markets present to us. What's on your mind these days? What would you say has got you most excited or most interested in terms of the current research docket? We haven't talked that much in our discussion about this other aspect of what we do at Elm, which is helping people to think about just their overall financial decisions, not just how they invest their wealth, but other financial decisions around how do they spend it? How do they think about intergenerational transfers? Where does philanthropy fit into all of that? And so there's this whole body of research that started in the 1970s that's generally known as long-term and consumption and portfolio choice, which looks at long-term investing combined with decisions around how do you deploy and spend the money and recognizing that those two things have to be related in some way, that things like the heuristic of like the 4% rule just doesn't make sense. It's better than nothing in terms of thinking about how do you spend in retirement from your wealth, but it's really far from the full credit answer of trying to think about this interaction between investment risk and risk in what your spending patterns and the use of your wealth is going to be. So we're doing a lot of research on the kind of big financial decisions that individuals and families face, and that can come into issues around realization of capital gains versus not realizing capital gains. And in general, the theme of all of this research that we do is that we need to explicitly bring risk into the decision process. So when you're making some decision about 
when you have some choice that you need to make a financial decision, you shouldn't just be thinking about what choice gives me the highest amount of expected money at the end of this choice. It has to really be which is giving me the highest risk-adjusted amount of money. And by risk-adjusted, we have to subtract something for the risk that you're taking in arriving at that. And so this idea of risk adjustment is tied to choice theory is fundamentally based on maximizing your expected utility and not your expected wealth. In many cases, the distinction isn't all that important in many decisions that we make, but even though it might not be critical in those decisions, it still is what's going on. And we're doing a lot of research there. We're trying to write a book. We haven't decided on the title, but it's really based around all the different decisions that we have to make that has to do with bringing risk explicitly into the choice, into the decision. So that's kind of just an overall really big area of research for us. And we've built some calculators that we make available to our clients and others that are interested in it to try to help them to make decisions around their long-term investing and spending decisions or taxation decisions and so on. Well, it's a challenging time to invest money that anyone's earned. It is. Asset prices seem expensive, interest rates are low. And so offering a process that's also very aggressively priced and transparent and easy to access, I think is really a service to investors. So I applaud you and your team for that. Victor, it's been great to have you as a guest, spend the hour with you. I appreciate the insights and really enjoyed the conversation. No, thank you very much, Dean. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to The Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. Thanks again and catch you next time. 